Dare I say I probably have the most Generation 1 Execute and Executor runs on the internet considering that I've done regular videos on both. I have an Egg Move Executor run, I just streamed an Execute Redo, and now I'm doing this video. When you also think about each video as a culmination of at least three different runs, that means that I became more attuned to the eggs than the good lord above ever intended any mortal man to be. Today we'll be continuing our Alolan Summer Adventure with an Alolan Executor solo run in Pokemon. On red, and you might be hopped up after Raichu's regional variant took over the top spot, but I would advise you to temper your expectations, big dog. And I forgot to mention this last week, but I did not create these front sprites. They belong to Pat Ackerman. I have one of his socials in the description if you want to check that out. His art's really good, but a huge shout out to him for giving me permission to use these sprites because they are top tier. Just like with Raichu, I'm going with the Generation 8 learn set because it's the most versatile and I think it yields the fastest results. Now it's worth noting yet again that all these level one moves that you're gonna see here, they're pretty much things that you would learn at the move relearner in new generations, but for the purposes of a gen one crossover, I am just gonna pick and choose what I want to use here. Dragon Hammer is a must because it's a Lowland Executor signature move. It doesn't have any effects, but it is a 90 base power dragon move. And the fact that nothing resists dragon in gen one, I think it just makes it really solid. Next up is Extra Sensory. It's an 80 base power psychic move that gives us good early coverage and it has a small flinch chance so that's pretty good. The next two moves are kind of synergistic with each other. First is wood hammer. It's an absolute nuke 120 base power but it does have recoil damage to worry about but I have added giga drain as well and it's going to kind of offset that. It's worth noting that this move was buffed to 75 base damage in gen 5 and the health drain will save us from having to use potions having to go into the menu so it will save a little bit of time. And as always the rules for the run are in the description and I also have an unlisted video if you want kind of a more in-depth look at the rules and the stuff that I use and all that and before we fully dive in let me just say that likes and comments go a long way to help channels grow and you guys know the drill by now if you have a spare second whether you're someone new maybe you're someone who just doesn't think about that sort of thing or maybe you're a returning subscriber like Eric R hit that like button and tell me if you like regional variants I personally love them I think they're one of the best ideas Pokemon's ever had and without further ado sit back relax grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's just dive into it. My philosophy is to choose the hardest starter and right from the start you might wonder why I would choose Squirtle since I have powerful grass moves and I double resist water. Now a lot of the times when you're doing these runs you have to look deeper into the later fights and see what he's going to have on his team and I think that the Blastoise fight is going to provide the deeper challenge. The Blastoise itself will ultimately have Blizzard. We are times four weak to I so it's going to hit like a truck and I just really don't have a great answer for the Cantonian Executor later and the way AI works in these games it's going to make Gyarados just spam Dragon Rage over and over and with good base health I think, it, I think it would just be a little bit too free. And speaking of stats, this is where we're going to see the biggest problems with Executor today. One of my biggest gripes in the Executor run, even when I did the Egg Move run that was much improved, was that really slow speed. And guys, when you're as long as this boy here, that means your speed's going to be even lower. Base 45 speed is atrocious, and it puts us in the same league as other Gen 1 Pokemon like Caterpie, Magnemite, and Venonat. It's just not very good. Outside of that fairly average defense, the rest of the stats are really solid with that special stat being huge for a non-legendary. As for the early game, it's it's just the bare minimum today. We do get to see just a tiny glimpse of our poison weakness. This Weedle does some pretty good damage, but thankfully Game Freak decided that poison types just get no love and they're, they get zero good moves and just like that, we're on to Brock. Honestly guys, I really just like the pacing of editing a video for the intro for the first gym, but it's really not needed today. We have very powerful grass moves, it's a very easy battle, Giga Drain does heal us up to full, it allows me to avoid going into the menu and use potions, and just like that, we're moving on. In the next route we do get outsped, so kind of similar to like a Snorlax situation, that means there's going to be a lot of battles in the run where we just have to take the first punch on the jaw and then move second. It is going to add a little bit of time, but we can one shot most things. Now here I want to take just a quick 
quick second to just say something, I guess, kind of off the top of my head real quick. We all have our favorite Pokemons. I think when you do these sort of runs, it's very important not to be biased and you got to give each Pokemon a fair chance, regardless of if you don't like it or you like it. But I would like to say right now that Alolan Executor is one of my favorite Pokemon. I think it might be a top five for me. I just love the design, but I think it's important to mention that even if I really like a Pokemon, I'm not going to keep doing the run over and over until it gets, I'm not going to give it any favoritism is what I'm trying to say, but I do want you guys to know that it's one of my favorite Pokemon ever. I love this Pokemon. As for Mount Moon, I'm implementing a strategy you've seen with a lot of slow leveling group runs that I do. I'll be picking up extra battles. That includes our friend Super Nerd here. I also need to battle one Geodude, and then I'll be battling the Hiker. This ensures that I'll hit level 15 when I'm going into Cerulean. And with a big beefy double resistance to water, it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and go to Misty. And there's not really much to say about this one. Her AI is only going to let her use Tackle. And we're decently tanky. We've kind of covered that. But Woodhammer does a whopping 360 effective power here. We don't have to worry about the recoil since we haven't healed yet. And we got a heal to anchor ourselves here anyway. So it's a very easy battle. And it gets us some extra experience looking ahead to rival number two. And I was a little bit worried about this one. At the end of the day, I just settled on kind of a luck based strategy. You just hope you don't get sand attacked too much. And today, it just goes for two quick attacks. That means that two Dragon Hammers can take it out. And despite being slower and the threat that this could have posed. I do get past this one and things go down fairly easy for that. The Abra does take a couple of extra turns, but it can't really do anything to us. We don't have any physical moves just yet, but this one went pretty smooth despite the huge speed difference. But it's worth noting that this was a fight that I was worried about. I had to reset a couple of times in practice. There's not much to talk about on Nugget Bridge, but there is one thing I would like to say. I was kind of fresh off of a practice run when I was doing this one and I just kind of, I don't know why I did it. I called an audible on the fly. I was thinking like, hey, the hiker guarding the elixir, it's not worth it. I had elixirs left over at the end of the game, so I'll just take on this Onyx Trainer, and I didn't really think about how that was going to mess with the experience. Now, it doesn't affect us too much. If I remember, I'll call it out, but I did just call this on the fly without even testing it, just because it's a little bit quicker just to take out this Onyx. But he did use Bind, so I don't even know if it was actually quicker at all, but it is what it is. I thought I would call it out. Down on the SSN, unfortunately, today we cannot get Body Slam, and all we can do before rival number three is fight the Gentleman Garden the Rare Candy. Now, we're our Grass Top, but the Dragon Dragon Topping does make it to where fire's just neutral, so it kind of eliminates one of Grass's weaknesses. It's a it's a pretty cool topping overall. I haven't talked about it a whole lot yet. Now, it's not a unique topping. You do have things like Gen 8 Flapple that share this topping now, but it's pretty cool. I like it a lot. I think I've said that twice in a row, but it's just fine. Now, as for rival number three, we do actually outspeed the Pidgeotto now that we've gotten a few more levels, so we can now just one-shot it and not worry about it. This fight is nothing. As for Surge, he's in a little bit of trouble this week because we double resist electric moves. If you took any damage earlier in the game down to the SSN, you can just heal it up with Giga Drain here. And then you, I don't even think you have to go Woodhammer. I just think Woodhammer is a cool move. But Surge, not really much of an issue. We take him out. And now I think we can skip all the way over Rock Tunnel, pick it back up in Celadon. The first order of business here, like usual, is to go to the Rocket Hideout. I am picking up all the high money items to sell to get more vitamins later. And Giovanni's not much of a challenge, but I would like to just sing some praise for Dragon Hammer. After doing several several runs here and I guess just playing a lot of gen 1 you don't really see a lot of dragon you don't see any because there's no actual dragon moves since dragon rage does flat damage but it was really solid when you have a pokemon with good special and you're getting to utilize a stab dragon move that's as solid as dragon hammer it feels really good it's very versatile and it comes in clutch when your the rest of your moves would otherwise be resisted or just not get the job done so I really like it and I really want to heap some praises on it because it was the MVP of this run it's kind of a weird signature move just because it doesn't really do anything, but I love signature moves nonetheless. Let's move on. Now we got a slight little change up. I am going to go straight to Erica now before I do anything else. I really don't want to grind a whole lot in this run because we're trying to see how fast these cross gen runs can be, but I am going to be taking out pretty much all of her trainers here. We do have extra sensory. It's pretty much super effective on everything. Dragon Hammer's neutral damage can also just make quick work of the unevolved Pokemon. So we grind a little bit and now I think we can take a look at Erica. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, this fight is very inconsistent, but if I do get this done now, I can afford a whole extra vitamin, and with the speed this low, it helps out a lot. Now, the problem here is that it's always going to go turn one poison powder. If it connects, then it's going to go for wrap. You can see that's exactly what happened. I can't quite one-shot it, and our crit chance is very low, so that's not very likely. And I had a lot of resets in practice here. This fight is not that great, and you can see that we're just getting wrapped, 
In Gen 1, while Rap is active, you can't even take a turn. So if you're poisoned, you're just sitting there getting poison tick put on you, Rap damage put on you, and it's adding up very quick. It's very frustrating. And you can see here that I go all the way down to 16 HP, and this is looking very grim, but the Victory Bell misses Rap. I hit the second extra sensory, and we're moving on to the Tangela. And thank God Tangela is one of the worst Pokemon ever created. It's so pathetic, and even though Giga Drain is resisted, I am going to use it just to get back a little bit of health because I don't need much to make it through this battle. But if I didn't use it, I think I'm just too low to make it. I mess around for a minute. I recover just a little bit of health. And eventually, I do take the Tangela out. And then I move on to the Vile Bloom. And that little bit of health was all I needed just to survive the heavily resisted Petal Dance or Mega Drain, whatever Vile Bloom wanted to use. And I'm actually able to clutch a victory from the Jaws of Defeat here. It was very close. And once again, let me reiterate, this battle was awful. And I only did it because it gives you an extra early Carbos and it was pretty good for the run. Sometimes you just gotta take a risk, you know guys? And this sets us up for a very strong Celadon buy. Now I don't mention this a whole lot, if you watch streams you probably know, but when I route these runs I only do one single buy just to be the most efficient because we're always going for the fastest time for these runs. When it's all said and done here, I am able to afford four Carbos and two Calciums and you might say why not just buy six Carbos? Well my friend, good question, glad you asked. I guess the short answer would be that Stat experience is limited to about 65,000. Once you hit the 25,000 mark, you can no longer use vitamins. And there are three extra Carbos found in the game. And if I were to buy any more than four, I would pretty much waste those free Carbos. And that's pretty much almost 10,000 Poke Dollars. So you might as well get the Calciums as well to get the maximum value. Class is over. Let's move on. Now let's take it over to Pokemon Tower. And I just want to show rival number four this week. I mean, we outspeed the Pidgeotto since we did last time. Time. This is the most imbalanced rival fight of the game, so it's always easy. We take it out with one shot, but I just wanted to show you guys one thing. Out of pettiness, I don't know what you would want to call it, I routed in the fact that I would hammer this Growlithe just for the maximum disrespect. I didn't need to, but I just wanted to one shot it with a resisted move. That's just, that's how I feel about Growlithe, guys. And I know if like, you're late to the videos, you might be saying, what did Growlithe ever do to you? Why are you always calling it pathetic? It's just a really bad Pokemon, all right? The run was just not great. It's in the slow leveling group, and it has awful stats. It's just not a good Pokemon. That's how I feel about it. And as for the rest of Pokemon Tower, extra sensory puts in extra work here, and we don't need to see the rest of this. When that's done with, I do quickly pick up the final way gems of the run, along with some extra vitamins down in the Safari Zone. And there's another slight variation of most routes that I'll do today. We're going to go straight down to Fuchsia before we head to Silph Co. I think Silph Co. is overall the fastest route to go if you can swing it, but with low speed, it just didn't feel really good. Now, I'm going to shine the spotlight on this juggler here. I don't reset, but it's just so annoying that Woodhammer can't quite one-shot the Drowsies consistently, and it makes this fight feel extra long. And there's really not any alternative of what you can do in the game right now. I don't want to grind because it's going to add too much time. Rival number five just doesn't really feel that consistent, so we're kind of stuck here throwing Woodhammer into some really high special opponents, and I just didn't like this fight. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I don't reset here. It's not really that hard. I just wanted to kind of call attention to it because it annoyed me. Now let's take a look at Uncle Koga. And just up front here, extra sensory can one shot the coughing, so things are looking pretty good, right? But remember, my friends, we are weak to poison. Muck can survive an extra sensory, and he gets off a sludge that does some pretty solid damage, takes us into the yellow health, but we get poisoned. That's the main thing to take note of before we take it out. And I've already mentioned earlier, we can one shot the next coughing as well. And now we're looking at the wheezing. And just like with Muck, one extra sensory is not enough to one shot. Koga, just to rub it in, uses an X attack, and that means his sludge is going to be more than enough to knock us out and give us the first reset of the run, but I'm not too worried. I wasn't even full health when I went into this battle, so I don't think it's too bad. This one wasn't quite as bad as Erica, but let's just move to the next attempt. And this one plays out about the same way with one key difference. We don't get poison put on us, but we still get taken to pretty much the same health as last time. Now let's skip ahead to the wheezing. Coco uses that patented X attack once again, but he doesn't go for sludge. He just goes for smog, and we have some pretty good defenses today. That means we hang on with just 11 HP, then we deal the lethal blow, and we take the badge. And honestly, guys, uh, today's run's pretty good, but last week's run was the top tier runs, but this is two weeks in a row that Koga has claimed a reset on our runs, so props to him. Usually, Koga's just kind of a speed bump, a little cliff note, but he's gotten two back-to-back -back intros and videos, so buy your Koga stocks now, because Uncle Koga is on the rise. 
Now we're heading over to Silphco, and this is kind of the point in the game where Executor is going to kind of make a big pivot, and this is also going to be the part to where we make some changes that kind of allow it to actually be a pretty good run instead of kind of fall behind, kind of like a Iron Thorns run or maybe a Tinkaton run. Like we see with pretty much every run I've ever done outside of Raichu, I am heading to the 10th floor, and it's very, very pivotal today. There's great things like the Carbos. We know we're slow, and we have to get these Carboses to keep up in speed later in the game. Rare Candy's nice too but the real prize is Earthquake. And I haven't really mentioned the TMs on the side. I have them over here so you can look. I don't think I've talked about them a whole lot, but we replace extra sensory, and you might be wondering why. There's also something else I can talk about real quick that you might be wondering as well, and that might be, hey Matt, why didn't you get Psychic? It probably would have made Koga easier. It's just stronger than extra sensory. And the thing is, you don't need it. I knew about the time that we unlocked Psychic that we would be getting Earthquake shortly after. And what you guys need to understand about these runs and Gen 1 in general is that Psychic and ground, they covered pretty much the same exact niche. There's a few spots in the game, mainly like Koga, maybe Agatha, that are weak to ground or psychic. So you want one or the other. You usually don't want both on the same learn set. And since we have some pretty good moves overall, there was just no need for it. But that's why we're replacing extra sensory. That's why we didn't pick up psychic. I thought it was worth addressing before maybe we got a comment about it. Yes, psychic might have been a good little side grade for a little bit, but the fact of the matter is I would have had to waste some time to even go get it and I was just going to replace it within like four minutes of real life time so it just wasn't worth it to me. Next up is the fact that this Pokemon can just randomly learn Swords Dance. I haven't mentioned it at all in the video. Badge boosting moves are just strong anyway and just don't forget that Alolan Executor does have a pretty nice attack stat and the fact that you can learn Earthquake which is pretty much like the premier physical move in Gen 1 maybe outside of Body Slam as well. It's actually pretty formidable and that's what I talked about earlier when we're going to make a hard pivot. I am going to replace wood hammer here i love wood hammer and i was really happy to get to use it but the fact of the matter is that giga drain is powerful enough in spots where you need it to get you back enough health and i do value that kind of sustain over the recoil damage after a few test runs I, it just it yielded better results but there's not much more else to talk about i think we can take a look at rival number five we held off a little bit now we got some upgrades let's see how it goes Pidgeot is first, and at this point in the game, it still has Sand Attack, so it's a little bit risky to try to do anything, and besides, our experience is set up a very specific way. So you just want to use Dragon Hammer here, and just kind of hope you don't get Sand Attack. Now, I guess luckily for us, maybe not so lucky, we are weak to flying, so it does prioritize Wing Attack, and he does about half our health before we finally go down, and let's see how the rest of this fight plays out. Now, Growlithe is next. You know how I feel about Growlithe, but we can't do anything today. Now, I do make a mistake here. I use Dragon Hammer. It's not a guarantee one shot I should use earthquake I opened myself to an ember if you were to get burned it would you'd have to reset so it was kind of a mistake there but it's only one turn it's not that big of a deal now the key thing here is after that part of the battle I do level up to 37 and this means I can now set up unfortunately the setup has to happen on execute our little brother from another region and it's gonna want to put status moves on you hypnosis would probably be the most annoying but everything's pretty bad here we have to set up to plus six so that's gonna take three swords dance so we get lucky the first couple of times it misses stun spore. It just goes for a little leech seed. But we're giving this thing so many turns we do get paralyzed at the end. But I'm fine with that because our attack is so buffed that Earthquake can take care of the rest of the fight. And we're a little bit tanky so we can just kind of soak the hits and then just keep moving on. But here at the end it uses Reflect which means it takes even an extra turn. And this thing is very annoying but I do take it out. I'd rather be annoyed by the eggs than get blasted by the Alakazam or something else. Alakazam comes in. I can survive the hit. I am getting a little low, but we are extra boosted, and Earthquake seals the deal. And as for the Blastoise, an Earthquake would have been a one-shot, but I'm a little bit low, and we've kind of mentioned Giga Drain and its usefulness, and just for safety, I went double Giga Drain just to recover some health to kind of ensure that I win the battle because I was pretty low, and you never know. Gen 1, you never know what's going to happen with the AI. It's just always looking for a way to screw you, and I didn't want to have to reset again. Now we can quickly just keep this train rolling to Sabrina, and just like a lot of runs, you don't really want to set up on the Kadabra, it's frail, you don't need it, and it's just, it's a lot more of a threat than something like Mr. Mom. So just take it out, move on, set up our Swords Dance. Now, plus two to our attack probably would have been sufficient. I 
guess I just wanted to be extra sure that I could knock out the Venomoth and not take some status condition or something annoying. But either way, I fumble a little bit. I use the wrong move on Mr. Mom, but at the end of the day, we sweep through this fight. That's another badge down. Not too bad. And about the only thing left to do now is take a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. It's summer out. The breeze is in the air. If you listen closely, you can hear the faint whispers of an ancient TM, but we're not going to talk about that just yet. Now, I want to talk about something that kind of changed in my routing. It was another thing that was kind of like on the fly. Inside of Sylph, I forgot to pick up a Calcium, and I know that there's a Calcium inside of Pokemon Mansion, so I went and picked it up. It's a little bit out of the way, but so was the Calcium in Sylph Coast. So it was about the same. I really just wanted that extra Calcium just to hit just a tiny bit harder, and there's nothing extra here today. I think after maybe just pondering a little summer edition of wondering if Tombstoner, brother, is actually the 28th TM or not, I think we can finally take a look at Blaine. And do you guys remember a long time ago where I said I called the Audible and I took on the Onyx on Nugget Bridge? Or I guess you should say after Nugget Bridge instead of the Hiker guarding the Elixir. Anyway, long story short, the other Hiker is worth a little bit more experience and this is the one single battle where it actually cost me, so buckle in for this one. Now this one's pretty simple on paper. You want to set up two Sword Stance, get to plus four attack. Now not only is that going to give you enough damage, but it's going to give you just enough speed to get past the little trivial annoying parts of the fight without getting bogged down by some potential downfalls. Now what ends up happening because we've done that other hacker is that we level up after Growlithe and we lose all of those extra little speed badge boosts that we got. Kind of annoying. This means that even though we outspeed Ponyta and we can get past it pretty easy with a single earthquake, it means that Rapidash now outspeeds us because we don't have those precious sweet badge boosts that we desperately need. And what's it gonna do you might ask? Well, it's gonna use fire spin forever until we die and since it's the computer and it decides hey I'm gonna win this one bro it doesn't matter if fire spin has 75% accuracy it's just never gonna miss it fire spins a pretty god-awful move but in the right hands of a cheating little filthy punk AI it's just never gonna miss and this is our second reset of the run and this is mainly my mistake I tried to be cheeky, I tried to route in just a random trainer to save a little bit of time, and I could not foresee the consequences down the line. And you might be saying, hey Matt, why don't you just do the run over again? Brother, I don't have that much time, what do you want from me? This is just a hobby, I'm trying to have fun here, not run 15 Alolan Executor runs and call out of my actual job just to get it done, you know what I'm saying? So we stick with what we got, it makes for good content, I'm happy, you're happy, let's get over it. And I think sometimes life is just funny like this, like you have a bad attempt and you figure out this horrible horrible error that you made up. It's not really that bad. It's just Blaine. I'm not going to be too dramatic about it. But on the second attempt, guys, I get burned. And like, if you didn't know, burn like halves your attack. It's like an ultra growl and it's just awful. Completely neuters us. So just on the fly here, I do just set up the full com I don't even care about the speed anymore. I set up the full complement of three swords dance and I just kind of use earthquake and it works out for some reason because Blaine just turns into Blaine. He misses moves. He goes for embers. It doesn't matter. We just take him out with earthquake because even though we're growled and our attack is pretty much halved, 254 attack with super effective earthquake damage is still a lot and we just win and that's just how it goes sometimes in gen 1 guys don't even question it just let it happen just embrace it as for giovanni i do set up a single swords dance because without it you would need two earthquakes for each of the nidoqueens queens and it just saves time overall now originally when i was uh, recording this audio i started to sound like scott steiner math again so i had to cut it out so you're welcome for that and the only thing that really happens in this fight is that i do get sand attack from doug trio but it doesn't really matter and the good thing about having these good moves right here is that I don't have to use an elixir or anything and we can just hop straight into rival number six. Pidgeot is first and even though it can do some really good damage to us it's important to always remember and I always bring this up it no longer has sand attack so you don't have that really annoying cheesy accuracy debuff on the table. We do get taken down to half health but that's just fine because I have this fight mapped out perfectly. Two dragon hammers takes it out and now we're on to the Rhyhorn. Right after the Pidgeot we level up and that means that these badge boosts are going to stick to the end of the fight perfectly. The sword stance is going to allow us to hit like an absolute truck and just a little extra badge boost is going to help out a lot. Now you might notice here, uh, hey I'm getting pretty low on this Rhyhorn and this is what I love about runs that have like Mega Drain or Giga Drain in this case is that Rhyhorn just a little nice little hyper potion. He's just here to give us back all of our HP because it's like eight times a week to grass and we just take it out, we slurp it up, we put our little straw in it and just... 
Mmm, is that rock and ground flavor? Cause we're getting back all our health today, boys. Growlithe is next, let's move on. Now the main reason that you'd be setting up Three Swords Dance is for this execute. Now it's pretty telling that, and I guess this is kind of like a reoccurring theme. I feel like I'm having deja vu. There's so many runs where just execute or executor just problems because they're so tanky and a lot of runs just don't have the moves to really deal with it. So here we are again. Now nothing ends up happening. I do make a mistake here. I'm pretty sure that Dragon Hammer's neutral damage was enough to one shot, but I do go for Earthquake. It's not quite enough, but nothing bad happens. No harm, no foul. We move on to the Alakazam and we don't outspeed here, but it doesn't matter. We're healthy enough just to kind of survive whatever. We can take it out in the next turn. And as for the Blastoise, we are missing a little health, so we could Giga Drain to get it back, but we aren't doing any extra battles. So Earthquake guarantees the one shot, makes us the fastest overall, and we're done with it. And now we can start thinking ahead to the final challenges of the run. Now there's some problems. We have some weaknesses here. Mainly, we gotta talk about Lorelai. Sit down guys, we gotta talk about Lorelai for yet another time and another run. We are times four weak to ice, and that's a problem. So immediately after this fight, I'm gonna use nine of the 11 potential rare candies. We're gonna get to level 53. That's a pretty nice level here. And instead of some other runs we've been doing in the past, I love to cut out the Victory Road rare candy, but today we absolutely need to pick it up to ensure some nice experience ranges so we don't level up at awful times. And that's really about it. If we can make it past Lorelai pretty comfortable, I'm pretty sure about the rest of the Elite Four, it's not gonna be too bad. But without further ado, I think we should just take a look at that battle because the Elite Four, it's coming up right now. Dugong is up first, and we know this Aurora Beam is going to hurt, so turn one, we set up a Sword Stance. It's going to give us a little tiny badge boost, and even though we have 125 base special and that little boost, that move still does over half our health, and it does not feel good. Now, something kind of counterintuitive you might not think here, we get the attack debuff, and that actually helps us out because it gives us a second badge boost. Turn two, we go for a second Sword Stance. It goes for another Aurora Beam. We barely hang on in the red health, 17 remaining, but at this point, the fight's pretty much over. Over. This is where Giga Drain comes in absolutely clutch and we're boosted enough to take out this Dugong and recover quite a bit of our lost health. Cloyster doesn't have near as much special as Dugong. We can easily one shot it. We get our health back up to full and even though Slowbro's a pretty tanky boy himself, Giga Drain can take care of him as well. As for the Jinx, I was a little bit worried that not having plus four on our attack right now would cost us, but it does. I was worried about nothing. Jinx is pretty frail on the defensive department. And as for Lapras, it does have Blizzard, but we got that drain of the Giga variety. It comes in clutch. We're at full health. And just like that, probably the biggest challenge of the entire run is down. And we kind of played this fight a little bit like Muhammad Ali. We kind of just took the punches and then we just struck back all at once. It was pretty impressive, but it's never fun to have a times four weakness to ice when going against Lorelai. And after such a mentally exhausting battle where you pretty much have to plan out all your practice runs just to get past it, it's time for Bruno. And we're using regular Bruno this week because why not? I feel like it's been a while on the cross-gen runs. There's nothing to say about this fight. I'm trying to stall for time just to let this footage go by, but <laughs> let's, let's go, just cut it. Cut the footage, cut. Next up is Agatha, and I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I completely mess up this fight for a number of reasons. But as for the battle itself, I just take some nightshades. I do need to set up one Swords Dance here. And you guys know I'm a little bit of a nerd. I know all my numbers here, and something just wasn't adding up. I was kind of looking at it, so I was a little distracted. So I used Dragon Hammer rather than Earthquake. It doesn't knock it out. I end up getting put to sleep, and ultimately it cost me the battle. So it's a reset here, but if you guys really want to know, is I was supposed to use my final two rare candies here. Now it does make Agatha a little bit easier, but the main reason I use the candies here is for the level up ranges that I'm gonna have in the champion fight. It puts me at some really precise level ranges when I level up. That really helps out in that fight. So it was really distracting. Uh, and let's just take a look at the next attempt. And I've already kind of quickly went over the strategy. You wanna go one swords dance here. And once again, I don't know if this is a mistake. All I can assume, I don't know why I use Dragon Hammer once again. I, I don't know, maybe I was flustered. But since I used Dragon Hammer once, I use it a second 
second time just because you're going to be using Dragon Hammer on the Golbat anyway. So it was a little bit risky and I could have gotten punished for it, but I didn't. It worked out fine. And outside of giving us perfect damage ranges on the two Gengars, the main thing the one Swords Dance setup did for us was that even though we have this really low speed, the middle part of the fight, we can outspeed it with just one Swords Dance speed badge boost. That means if you look closely at the Haunter, it has 118 speed, we have 119, and it makes things a little bit more consistent here. Now, if you make it past the first Gengar and the Golbat doesn't do any shenanigans like use Haze or something like that, you pretty much have this fight because I'm on the record here. I think the final Gengar is one of the worst Pokemon in the game that's as good as it is because it doesn't have Hypnosis. And in general, if you have any damage at all, if you're just a competent Pokemon, it's not really that hard. But we get past this one. That reset, just like Blaine, was kind of my fault. So don't be too harsh on Alolan Executor just yet. As for Lance, Gyarados is up first. And I mentioned a long time ago that I didn't want Gyarados on the Champions team because it will only go for Dragon Rage. And you see that here. Now what's really annoying about this fight is I don't want to set up on the Gyarados. I don't want to risk like a Hyper Beam crit. And there's a really high chance that a Dragon Hammer is just going to two shot anyway. But here it doesn't two shot. That means it gets off a third Dragon Rage. And if you're any good at math, you know 40 times three is 120. And that's a lot of flat health damage when we finally go into the Dragonair. We do level up. That means it's the perfect time to set up. But just like with Gyarados, these things are going to prioritize Dragon Rage as well. And with two Swords Dance, meaning that we have to tank two Dragon Rages once again, that means we're down to just six health. And this one is pretty much over. I didn't have much hope. I was kind of rolling my eyes thinking I'm going to have to reset on Lance, a fight that I practiced a good bit. We outspeed both the Dragonairs now that we're set up, so that's not really an issue. But sometimes, guys, in these runs, and I really like it when this happens, a Pokemon just absolutely clutches a victory, and I love to see it. Now, on the Aerodactyl, we're outsped, and pretty much anything, a water move could, a double resisted water move could knock us out right now. But here's what happens. It goes for Hyper Beam, it misses, and we get off the Giga Drain. Now, this is just neutral damage, but it does give us quite a good bit of health back, and we needed every bit of it because it goes for a Hyper Beam next. It does some pretty good damage, but overall, we end up with a pretty big net gain of HP, but we are kind of low going into the Dragonite. But that's just fine because with those badge boosts, we do outspeed it, and we have a very heavy, hard-hitting Dragon move. We can one-shot it, and just like that, Alolan Executor clutches another win. But there is one battle left. Pidgeot is first, and we already know that it does super effective damage, but we do need to take a tiny risk here. We need to set up once just for damage ranges coming up on the Alakazam. We end up taking some pretty hefty damage, but that's all right. We set up once. Eventually, we do take it out with a couple of Dragon Hammers. In no alternate reality do we ever outspeed Alakazam, so it does go first. It gets off a Psy Beam. It does some pretty good damage, but we're getting pretty low, but the Earthquake ensures that we take it out in one hit, and just like as planned, the reason why we use the rare candies on Agatha is that we'll level up perfectly going into our nice little milkshake ride down here and I don't know about you guys but I'm feeling pretty thirsty now that we've leveled up we can set up our last two swords dance get those final badge boost and just to help us out here ride throws in the extra small fry by giving us a leer for an additional badge boost so thanks for the help buddy and afterward we stab that straw in and Mmm, is that rock and ground top? Because we're healing up to full today, boys, just like its little brother, Rhyhorn. Rhydon is helping us out. This is the real homie of the run. And I would dare say that this Pokemon is, they gave us the ultimate fist bump. It allowed us to really cruise through this final battle here. Arcanine is next. We are fully set up with Swords Dance. Earthquake takes it out. There's no messing around here today. And next up is the long awaited mirror match. Alolan versus Cantonian. Who will win? Well, we all know that the Cantonian Executor doesn't have any moves. And all you can do here is hope that you don't get put to sleep by hypnosis. And wouldn't you know it, guys, that's exactly what happens. But Alolan Executor decides that it's clutch once again. It immediately wakes up. We get off the second Dragon Hammer, and we're moving on to the end of the fight. The Blastoise is waiting there, but look at our attack. We got 824. That means the ground's trembling, and one more earthquake will end this run and give us Executor's final time of the run. And that's it. Alolan Executor has done it. Now remember, just like last week, we are playing with fastest techs on our cross-gen runs because I did figure that out. I probably say that too much, just be but I really want you guys to know. I want to be transparent. All of my other vanilla runs are with fastest techs, and I'm just really happy that everything's on the, the same footing. But you can see that this week, we kind of have more of a standard run with a final time of 2 hours, 6 minutes, and 4 seconds. It's not too shabby. And I would just like to call out here, 
pat myself on the back, I guess. I love that I put three different crowns, four different crowns if you count the tail on this final sprite. You had to do some extra work on this hurt sprite, faint sprite, and the crown art at the end, but I think it was well worth it. It's one of my best work. It makes me really happy. Like I said, I really love this Pokemon. And now that Alolan Executor does have its tier card, now we can kind of rank it on the list. If we roll this out here, I think a very comfortable and clear spot for it is at number seven, right in front of Diggersby. Like I said, two of these resets here. It does have the most resets, but two of them were caused by me, so I'm not going to hold it against it too much. But it was a pretty solid run, especially when you consider that 45 base speed. It's a real detriment, so it was kind of impressive how it actually went through the game despite that one fatal flaw. I would dare say that maybe outside of Iron Thorns having the, the mostly all special moves and not being able to use that massive attack stat, I would say that this 45 speed on this run was probably the biggest drawback. But it was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Now we've done two regional variants. Next week, we might have a very special fire cat. And I guess now that I'm thinking about it, there's like two two fire cats in uh, Sun and Moon. So I guess you get to decide what that'll be. But I think that's about it for me, guys. Special shout out to my channel members. I do appreciate you guys. The support you provide is amazing. It's really, it's really comforting to know that there's some people out there that care enough to support me. And I just really want you guys to know from the bottom of my heart that I appreciate it. And once again, like always, if you're listening to my voice right now, you're a real one. Comment real one down in the chat so I can know you made it that far because I do appreciate you as well. And and for me, I'm still on that grind. We're gonna get, I'm gonna get straight back into the lab and we're gonna start making some more cross-gen runs and we're gonna try to keep this rolling. But next week, we're doing an actual sun and moon Pokemon, not just a regional variant. So stay tuned for that. Pretty exciting. Hell, I don't even know. Weeks ago, I might have released a schedule. I don't know yet. I'm getting ahead. You guys know that my life's pretty busy, so I'm gonna record a bunch of these in bulk. But let's not bloat the video. I'm going on too long. I'm babbling. Someone tell me to stop. But I guess I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye.